The CD417 decimal counter is an integrated circuit that can count from 0 to 9 and you can use it in a huge variety of electronics projects. In this 7 step tutorial we will start with a basic circuit, debounce the push button and add a power on reset so that it always starts at 0, learn how to make it count from 0 to 5 instead, combine multiple CD417 chips to count from 0 to 99, learn how to reset those with logic gates and a reliable reset circuit and even add a custom external clock signal. I will also show you exactly what electronic components you need and then we will build everything step by step. And at the end of this tutorial you will understand this entire schematic here with all of its different parts and components. So let's get started and learn everything about the CD417, the integrated circuit you can count on. Hi, my name is Jens and I believe that everybody can learn electronics and this channel is all about beginner friendly electronics tutorials and projects with and without microcontrollers. And if you want to follow along today's tutorial, here's what you need. Two 830 pin breadboards, a 9 volt battery with a battery clip, 22 LEDs and 470 ohm resistors, 6 4.7 kilo ohms resistors and a 1N4148 diode, two CD417 counter ICs, one CD4081 AND gate IC, two NE555 timers, six 100 nanofarad capacitors, one 1 microfarad capacitor, two 22 microfarad capacitors, one 100 microfarad capacitor, two 10 nanofarad capacitors and two push buttons. To begin with, in step 1, let's have a look at the basic circuit. In the middle you can see the CD4017 and these 10 LEDs here are connected to the 10 outputs Q0 through Q9 with a 470 ohms resistor each. Then we have to make sure that the CD417 has power and because it's a CMOS chip it can take anything between 3 and 18 volts and here we will use a 9 volt battery for convenience. The power supply pins are this funny looking symbol here. It's always a good idea to add a 100 nanofarad bypass capacitor in parallel to the chip as well as a larger bulk capacitance like this 100 microfarad capacitor right here to stabilize the overall circuit. The counter increases its value whenever there is a positive pulse at the CLK or clock input, which is what the button S1 does. R11 is a pull down resistor so that the clock input is held low whenever S1 is not pressed. And in the same way, pushing S2 instead resets the counter back to zero. CI stands for clock inhibit and whenever it is high, the counter ignores all clock pulses on the CLK pin. Here we don't need that functionality, so we can permanently connect clock inhibit to ground. And last, CO stands for carry out and we will get back to that later in step 4. Alright, let's go ahead and build it on a breadboard. Place the two 830 pin breadboards in front of you, connect them together and make sure that row 1 points to the left on both of them. For the upper breadboard, connect the positive power rail at the top and the bottom and do the same for the negative power rail. Next repeat these steps for the lower breadboard and finally connect the positive power rail of the upper breadboard to the positive power rail of the lower one and do the same for the ground power rail. Make sure that you are using this type of breadboard here. There is a different type out there which is the same size but where there are two independent power rails. In that case you also need to put in connections in between. Thanks to Smiffer67 for pointing that out to me on Twitter, I had no idea. Okay, but for now we will focus on the upper breadboard and build our schematic from before. Place the CD4017 in row 9 and make sure its notch points to the left. The pins are labeled like this. Connect pin 16 to VDD, pin 8 to ground and insert the 100 nanofarad bypass capacitor between pin 16 and 8 as close to the CD417 as possible. Then insert the 10 LEDs starting in row 21 and leaving two empty rows in between. Make sure that the LED's cathodes, that is the shorter one of an LED's two wires, are located here and then insert the 470 ohms resistors from each LED's cathode into the ground rail. Now it's time to connect the LED's anodes to the outputs of the CD417 and you can just follow the schematic step by step or check out the companion article for more details. Then insert the two push buttons S1 and S2 and connect one of each terminal to the positive power rail. Connect the other terminal to clock at pin 14 and to reset at pin 15. Then insert the two 4.7 kilo ohms pull down resistors between reset and ground and clock and ground. 
Connect the clock inhibit input at pin 13 to ground and last insert the 100 microfarad capacitor in the power rail. Make sure you get the polarity right and its negative terminal, that's the one with the big minus sign, is plugged into the ground rail. Now you can plug in the 9 volt battery into the power rail and we're done with step 1. And here you see it works. Well, kind of. Sure, we can increase the counter by pressing S1 and reset it by pressing S2. But quite often when pressing S1 the counter jumps ahead not just by 1 but by 2 or even 3 positions. This is because many push buttons bounce. This is a mechanical problem that causes switches to rapidly open and close multiple times when actually only pressed once. An easy way to stop push buttons from bouncing, and we call that debouncing, is to add a small capacitor in parallel because then the signal looks more like this. So we can simply add a 1 microfarad capacitor C3 in parallel to S1 and on the breadboard we can insert it right here. Again make sure that you get the polarity right, its negative terminal goes straight into the ground rail. And sure enough, that solves it. Now if you're building this circuit along with the video, maybe you'll notice something. When you remove the battery and reconnect it, the counter doesn't always start back at zero. Sometimes it starts where you left it off before disconnecting the battery. If that doesn't bother you then great, but if it does we better fix it. And it's actually quite simple. Just add a small 100 nanofarad capacitor between the reset pin and VDD. This way there will be a voltage at the reset pin whenever the circuit is powered up for the first time and C4 carries no charge. And that voltage will go away when the capacitor C4 gets charged up, which happens very quickly for such a small capacitor. Here is how that looks like on the breadboard. You can plug the capacitor into the positive power rail like that and sure enough now the counter always starts at zero when powered off and on again. So far we have used the CD417 as a decimal counter, meaning that it starts at 0 and it ends at 9. But what if you want something else? So let's learn how to reset it somewhere else and make it count from 0 to 5 instead. In that case, simply connect the output Q6 to the reset pin. It is a good idea to insert the diode D1 so that whenever you press the reset button, no current can flow into the output Q6, which could damage our CD417. Back on the breadboard, insert the diode D1 like this and make sure that its cathode, the black ring, points to the left and its anode is connected to LED7 at output Q6. Then connect its cathode to reset at pin 15 of the CD417. It's a bit hard to see, but make sure that you don't accidentally plug the diode's cathode into the neighboring LED, we are using an empty row here. And if you plug the battery back in, you now have a counter from 0 to 5. And it of course works exactly the same way for any other counting limit. And now it's time to count to more than 9 and that is where the CO or carry out pin comes in. Whenever the counter is at 9 and receives an additional clock pulse and goes back to 0, the carry out pin sends out a pulse as well and we can use that as a clock pulse for a second counter. That's just like what real life counters do when their 1s overflow and the 10s are increased by 1. Back on the breadboard, let's first remove the reset wire and the diode from before and add a second CD417 chip on the lower breadboard. Connect VDD, ground and the bypass capacitor as before, connect the clock inhibit pin to ground and then connect the 10 LEDs and their 470 ohms resistors to the CD417 just as before. Looking at both counters, connect the carry out pin of the first CD417 at pin 12 to the clock input of the second CD417 at pin 14. The reset lines are connected in parallel and that's it. And now you have a counter from 0 to 99. But what if you want to have a counter from 0 to 25 only? This means that we need to reset whenever the first counter is at 6 and the second counter is at 2. And for that we can use the CD4081 integrated circuit. It has 4 AND gates and each AND gate has 2 inputs and 1 output. Only if both inputs are high, the output is high as well, for all other combinations it is low. And that's exactly what we need here. Again it's a good idea to use a diode to connect the output of the AND gate to the reset line because otherwise a current could flow into the output of the AND gate whenever S2 is pressed and that is not a good thing. Let's put it on the breadboard. 
place the CD4081 in row 55 on the lower breadboard and make sure its notch points to the left. The pins are labeled like this. Connect VDD at pin 14 and ground at pin 7 and connect another 100 nanofarad bypass capacitor close to the chip. Then we can wire up the inputs. Connect the anode of LED 7 to pin 2 and the anode of LED 13 to pin 1 of the CD4081. Then insert diode D1 between pin 3 of the CD4081 and row 63 on the very right. Make sure the diode's cathode, the black ring, points to the right. Connect over to the other side and then connect to the reset line like this. All done and it looks like it should work, right? Well, let's see. And it doesn't work. Why? Because our reset line is actually not stable. Basically what happens is that whenever the AND gate goes high and the reset line goes high as well, one of the counters resets before the other one. But that removes the condition for the AND gate to be turned on in the first place because one of the counters is reset back to zero and that way the other counter doesn't get reset. Maybe you can tell me in the comments if this circuit is working properly for you. I built this five or six times and I just couldn't get it to work reliably. At that point I realized that the only way out is a proper reset circuit. And for that we can use the any 5 which we covered in the tutorial before. So let's have a look at the schematic and see how it looks like. C7 and C8 are bypass capacitors and the LED is just there to show whenever the circuit is active. The important components are the other two resistors and the capacitor. When the entire circuit is first powered up, it also acts as a power on reset that we talked about in step 3. This is nice and convenient and we could in principle remove C4 now since we no longer need it. This is how it works. At the beginning the capacitor C9 is uncharged and that triggers the NE555 output to go on. But then C9 keeps charging through R23 and the voltage increases. If it reaches two thirds of VDD, which is 6 volt in our case, then the output of the NE555 is turned off again and is internally connected to ground. And with the output being off, C9 now discharges rapidly through the discharge pin. But because the output is off, the reset pin is pulled to ground as well via R24, which resets the NE555 permanently and prevents the trigger to take place as soon as the voltage at C9 falls below one third of VDD, which is 3 volts in this case. And after that, the timer is in a stable state and just waits. This all happens very rapidly in the first moments the circuit is powered on and the time is approximately 71 milliseconds with the values I use in this circuit. Okay, so now what happens if a reset signal occurs and the AND gate sends a signal to the slash reset input of the NE505? As soon as that happens, the timer is released from reset mode. C9 is charged again and the entire cycle that we described before happens again. As soon as the voltage reaches 6 volt, it is rapidly discharged and kept at that state permanently. The important detail is this. Even if the signal at the slash reset input is very short, it will start this entire process and generate an output signal of a fixed length, independent of how long the initial pulse was. And this last part is very important because it guarantees that the reset signal can continue to exist even if the AND gate has stopped firing a whole while ago. Back on the breadboard, first remove the old reset wire from the output of the CD4081 at row 63 to the reset line. Insert the NE555 in row 57 of the upper breadboard and make sure its notch points to the left. The pins are labeled like this. Connect VDD at pin 8 ground at pin 1 and insert the 100 nanofarad and 10 nanofarad bypass capacitors. Next connect pins 2 and 7 and then pin 7 and 6. Insert the 4.7 kilo ohms resistor between pin 6 and VDD and the other 4.7 kilo ohms resistor between pins 3 and 4. Now place the 22 microfarad capacitor between pin 1 and 2 and make sure the negative terminal, the one with the minus sign, is connected to pin 1. Connect pin 3 to row 62, place the blue LED with the cathode facing towards the upper part of the breadboard and connect it to the ground rail with a 470 ohms resistor. And all that is now left to do is to connect pin 3, the output of the CD4081, to pin 4 of the NE555 and then connect the output of the NE555 at pin 3 to the reset line like this. And that's it, time to give it a try. 
First off, you can see that the reset now works properly and resets the counter at 25 and the blue LED flashes quickly whenever this reset happens. When you disconnect and then reconnect the battery, you can also see that the blue LED flashes ever so quickly as well, which goes to show that it really works as a power on reset as well. Now, I don't know about you, but at this point I was pretty tired of all the button pushing. So I figured why not use another NE555 timer I see, this time as an oscillator, to generate a clock signal for us. And here is how the resulting schematic looks like. C10 and C11 are bypass capacitors and the resistors R26 and R27 and the capacitor C12 set the frequency to around 5 Hz. We can connect the output at pin 3 directly to the clock pin of the first CD417. On the breadboard, place the NE555 in row 3 of the lower breadboard with its notch facing to the left. Connect VDD at pin 8 and ground at pin 1 and connect the 100 nanofarad and 10 nanofarad bypass capacitors just as before. Next, connect pin 7 to VDD with a 4.7 kilo ohms resistor and then place another 4.7 kilo ohms resistor between pins 6 and 7. Connect pin 4 to VDD and place the 22 microfarad capacitor between pin 2 and ground and make sure that the capacitor's negative terminal, the one with the minus sign, is really plugged into the ground rail. Next, connect pin 2 to pin 6. Then connect a wire from pin 3 a few rows to the right to row 8 Insert the red LED with its anode pointing towards the bottom of the breadboard and on the other side connect the LED's cathode to ground with a 470 ohms resistor. Now move the reset and carry out wires out of the way by disconnecting them only at the top. Connect pin 3 of the NE555 to the clock pin of the upper CD417 at pin 14 and then reconnect the reset and carry out wires. And now we're really done and when you plug in the power, the counter will work on its own. I really hope you find this tutorial useful and learned how you can use the CD417 in a future project yourself. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. And if you're still here, uh, thank you. Because I don't upload every week, some viewers have asked me to set up an email list to send out monthly notifications whenever there is a new article or new video and you can find the link to the sign up sheet in the description. I programmed this email list myself and there is no third party software involved. So you can always unsubscribe and that really deletes your email permanently from the database. Thanks for watching.